Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the February 2021 edition of Socialism for All. And this is an audiobook of Letter to American Workers by Vladimir Lenin, written 20 August 1918. It was first published in Pravda number 178, August 22, 1918, published according to the Pravda text, checked with the manuscript. The source is Lenin's Collected Works, Progress Publishers, Moscow, Volume 28, 1965. It was translated and edited by Jim Riordan. Transcription and HTML markup by David Walters. And thanks to the Lenin Internet Archive, 2002, Marxists.org, the Marxists Internet Archive. Let's get into the audiobook. Comrades, a Russian Bolshevik who took part in the 1905 revolution and who lived in your country for many years afterwards, has offered to convey my letter to you. I have accepted his proposal all the more gladly because just at the present time, the American revolutionary workers have to play an exceptionally important role as uncompromising enemies of American imperialism, the freshest, strongest, and latest in joining in the worldwide slaughter of nations for the division of capitalist profits. At this very moment, the American multimillionaires, these modern slave owners, have turned an exceptionally tragic page in the bloody history of bloody imperialism by giving their approval, whether direct or indirect, open or hypocritically concealed, makes no difference, to the armed expedition launched by the brutal Anglo-Japanese imperialists for the purpose of throttling the first socialist republic. The history of modern civilized America opened with one of those great, really liberating, really revolutionary wars, of which there have been so few compared to the vast numbers of wars of conquest, which, like the present imperialist war, were caused by squabbles among kings, landowners or capitalists over the division of usurped lands or ill-gotten gains. That was the war the American people waged against the British robbers who oppressed America and held her in colonial slavery, in the same way as these, quote, civilized bloodsuckers are still oppressing and holding in colonial slavery hundreds of millions of people in India, Egypt, and all parts of the world. About 150 years have passed since then. Bourgeois civilization has borne all its luxurious fruits. America has taken first place among the free and educated nations in level of development of the productive forces of collective human endeavor, in the utilization of machinery, and of all the wonders of modern engineering. At the same time, America has become one of the foremost countries in regard to the depth of the abyss which lies between the handful of arrogant multimillionaires who wallow in filth and luxury, and the millions of working people who constantly live on the verge of pauperism. The American people who set the world an example in waging a revolutionary war against feudal slavery now find themselves in the latest capitalist stage of wage slavery to a handful of multimillionaires and find themselves playing the role of hired thugs who, for the benefit of wealthy scoundrels, throttled the Philippines in 1898 on the pretext of, quote, liberating them and are throttling the Russian Socialist Republic in 1918 on the pretext of, quote, protecting it from the Germans. The four years of the imperialist slaughter of nations, however, have not passed in vain. The deception of the people by the scoundrels of both robber groups, the British and the German, has been utterly exposed by indisputable and obvious facts. The results of the four years of war have revealed the general law of capitalism as applied to war between robbers for the division of spoils. The richest and strongest profited and grabbed most, while the weakest were utterly robbed, tormented, crushed, and strangled. The British imperialist robbers were the strongest in number of, quote, colonial slaves. The British capitalists have not lost an inch of, quote, their territory, i.e. territory they have grabbed over the centuries. But they have grabbed all the German colonies in Africa. They have grabbed Mesopotamia and Palestine. They have throttled Greece and have begun to plunder Russia. The German imperialist robbers were the strongest in organization and discipline of, quote, their armies, but weaker in regard to colonies. They have lost all their colonies, but plundered half of Europe and throttled the largest number of small countries and weak nations. What a great war of, quote, liberation on both sides. How well the robbers of both groups, the Anglo-French and the German capitalists, 
together with their lackeys, the social chauvinists, i.e. the socialists who went over to the side of, quote, their own bourgeoisie, have, quote, defended their country. The American multimillionaires were, perhaps, richest of all, and geographically the most secure. They have profited more than all the rest. They have converted all, even the richest countries, into their tributaries. They have grabbed hundreds of billions of dollars, and every dollar is sullied with filth, the filth of the secret treaties between Britain and her, quote, allies, between Germany and her vassals, treaties for the division of the spoils, treaties of mutual, quote, aid for oppressing the workers and persecuting the international socialists. Every dollar is sullied with the filth of, quote, profitable war contracts, which in every country made the rich richer and the poor poorer, and every dollar is stained with blood, from that ocean of blood that has been shed by the 10 million killed and 20 million maimed in the great, noble, liberating, and holy war to decide whether the British or the German robbers are to get most of the spoils, whether the British or the German thugs are to be foremost in throttling the weak nations all over the world. While the German robbers broke all records in war atrocities, the British have broken all records, not only in the number of colonies they have grabbed, but also in the subtlety of their disgusting hypocrisy. This very day, the Anglo-French and American bourgeois newspapers are spreading, in millions and millions of copies, lies and slander about Russia, and are hypocritically justifying their predatory expedition against her on the plea that they want to, quote, protect Russia from the Germans. It doesn't require many words to refute this despicable and hideous lie. It's sufficient to point to one well-known fact. In October 1917, after the Russian workers had overthrown their imperialist government, the Soviet government, the government of the revolutionary workers and peasants, openly proposed a just peace, a peace without annexations or indemnities, a peace that fully guaranteed equal rights to all nations, and it proposed such a peace to all the belligerent countries. It was the Anglo-French and the American bourgeoisie who refused to accept our proposal. It was they who even refused to talk to us about a general peace. It was they who betrayed the interests of all nations. It was they who prolonged the imperialist slaughter. It was they who, banking on the possibility of dragging Russia back into the imperialist war, refused to take part in the peace negotiations and thereby gave a free hand to the no less predatory German capitalists who imposed the annexationist and harsh breast peace upon Russia. It's difficult to imagine anything more disgusting than the hypocrisy with which the Anglo-French and American bourgeoisie are now blaming us for the Brest Peace Treaty. The very capitalists of those countries, which could have turned the Brest negotiations into general negotiations for a general peace, are now our accusers. The Anglo-French imperialist vultures, who have profited from the plunder of colonies and the slaughter of nations, have prolonged the war for nearly a whole year after Brest, and yet they accuse us, the Bolsheviks, who proposed a just peace to all countries, they accuse us, who tore up, published and exposed to public disgrace, the secret criminal treaties concluded between the ex-Czar and the Anglo-French capitalists. The workers of the whole world, no matter in which country they live, greet us, sympathize with us, applaud us for breaking the iron ring of imperialist ties, of sordid imperialist treaties, of imperialist chains, for breaking through to freedom and making the heaviest sacrifices in doing so. For, as a socialist republic, although torn and plundered by the imperialists, keeping out of the imperialist war and raising the banner of peace, the banner of socialism for the whole world to see. Small wonder that the international imperialist gang hates us for this, that it accuses us, that all the lackeys of the imperialists, including our right socialist revolutionaries and Mensheviks, also accuse us. The hatred these watchdogs of imperialism express for the Bolsheviks and the sympathy of the class-conscious workers of the world convince us more than ever of the justice of our cause. A real socialist would not fail to understand that for our sake of achieving victory over the bourgeoisie, for the sake of power passing to the workers, for the sake of starting the world proletarian revolution, we cannot and must not hesitate to make the heaviest sacrifices, including the sacrifice of part of our territory, the sacrifice of heavy defeats at the hand of imperialism. A real socialist 
would have proved by deeds his willingness for his country to make the greatest sacrifice to give a real push forward to the cause of the socialist revolution. For the sake of their cause, that is, for the sake of winning world hegemony, the imperialists of Britain and Germany have not hesitated to utterly ruin and throttle a whole number of countries, from Belgium and Serbia to Palestine and Mesopotamia. But must socialists wait with their cause, the cause of liberating the working people of the whole world from the yoke of capital, of winning universal and lasting peace, until a path without sacrifice is found? Must they fear to open the battle until an easy victory is guaranteed? Must they place the integrity and security of their bourgeois-created fatherland above the interests of the world socialist revolution? The scoundrels in the international socialist movement who think this way, those lackeys who grovel to bourgeois morality, thrice stand condemned. The Anglo-French and American imperialist vultures accuse us of concluding an agreement with German imperialism. What hypocrites, what scoundrels they are to slander the workers' government while trembling because of the sympathy displayed towards us by the workers of, quote, their own countries. But their hypocrisy will be exposed. They pretend not to see the difference between an agreement entered into by socialists with the bourgeoisie, their own or foreign, against the workers, against the working people, and an agreement entered into for the protection of the workers who have defeated their bourgeoisie, with the bourgeoisie of one national color against the bourgeoisie of another color, in order that the proletariat may take advantage of the antagonisms between the different groups of bourgeoisie. In actual fact, every European sees this difference very well, and, as I shall show in a moment, the American people have had a particularly striking illustration of it in their own history. There are agreements and agreements, as the French say. When in February 1918 the German imperialist vultures hurled their forces against unarmed, demobilized Russia, who had relied on the international solidarity of the proletariat before the world revolution had fully matured, I did not hesitate for a moment to enter into an agreement with the French monarchists. Captain Sadoul, a French army officer who, in words, sympathized with the Bolsheviks, but was in deeds a loyal and faithful servant of French imperialism, brought the French officer de Lubersac to see me. Quote, I am a monarchist. My only aim is to secure the defeat of Germany, de Lubersac declared to me. Quote, that goes without saying, I replied. But this did not in the least prevent me from entering into an agreement with de Lubersac containing certain services that French army officers, experts in explosives, were ready to render us by blowing up railway lines in order to hinder the German invasion. This is an example of an agreement of which every class-conscious worker will approve, an agreement in the interests of socialism. The French monarchist and I shook hands, although we knew that each of us would willingly hang his partner, but for a time our interests coincided. Against the advancing rapacious Germans, we, in the interests of the Russian and the World Socialist Revolution, utilized the equally rapacious counter-interests of other imperialists. In this way, we served the interests of the working class of Russia and of other countries. We strengthened the proletariat and weakened the bourgeoisie of the whole world. We resorted to the methods, most legitimate and essential in every war, of maneuver, stratagem, retreat, in anticipation of the moment when the rapidly maturing proletarian revolution in a number of advanced countries completely matured. However much the Anglo-French and American imperialist sharks fume with rage, however much they slander us, no matter how many millions they spend on bribing the right socialist revolutionary, Menshevik, and other social patriotic newspapers, I shall not hesitate one second to enter into a similar agreement with the German imperialist vultures if an attack upon Russia by Anglo-French troops calls for it and I know perfectly well that my tactics will be approved by the class-conscious proletariat of Russia, Germany, France, Britain, America, in short, of the whole civilized world. Such tactics will ease the task of the social revolution, will hasten it, will weaken the international bourgeoisie, will strengthen the position of the working class which is defeating the bourgeoisie. The American people resorted to these tactics long ago to the advantage of their revolution. 
when they waged their great war of liberation against the British oppressors, they had also against them the French and the Spanish oppressors, who owned a part of what is now the United States of North America. In their arduous war for freedom, the American people also entered into agreements with some oppressors against others for the purpose of weakening the oppressors and strengthening those who were fighting in a revolutionary manner against oppression, for the purpose of serving the interests of the oppressed people. The American people took advantage of the strife between the French, the Spanish, and the British. Sometimes they even fought side by side with the forces of the Spanish and French oppressors against the British oppressors. First, they defeated the British and then freed themselves, partly by ransom, from the French and the Spanish. Historical action is not the pavement of Nevsky Prospect, said the great Russian revolutionary Chernyshevsky. A revolutionary would not agree to a proletarian revolution only on the condition that it proceeds easily and smoothly, that there is, from the outset, combined action on the part of the proletarians of different countries, that there are guarantees against defeats, that the road of the revolution is broad, free, and straight, that it will not be necessary during the march to victory to sustain the heaviest casualties, to, quote, bide one's time in a besieged fortress, or to make one's way along extremely narrow, impassable, winding, and dangerous mountain tracks. Such a person is no revolutionary. He has not freed himself from the pedantry of the bourgeois intellectuals. Such a person will be found constantly slipping into the camp of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie, like our right socialist revolutionaries, Mensheviks, and even, although more rarely, left socialist revolutionaries. Echoing the bourgeoisie, these gentlemen like to blame us for the, quote, chaos of the revolution, for the, quote, destruction of industry, for the unemployment and the food shortage. How hypocritical these accusations are, coming though from those who welcomed and supported the imperialist war, or who entered into an agreement with Kerensky who continued this war. It is this imperialist war that is the cause of all these misfortunes. The revolution engendered by the war cannot avoid the terrible difficulties and suffering bequeathed it by the prolonged ruinous reactionary slaughter of the nations. To blame us for the destruction of industry or for the terror is either hypocrisy or dull-witted pedantry. It reveals an inability to understand the basic conditions of the fierce class struggle raised to the highest degree of intensity that is called revolution. Even when accusers of this type do recognize the class struggle, they limit themselves to verbal recognition. Actually, they constantly slip into the Philistine utopia of class agreement and collaboration, for in revolutionary epochs the class struggle has always, inevitably, and in every country, assumed the form of civil war, and civil war is inconceivable without the severest destruction, terror, and the restriction of formal democracy in the interests of this war. Only unctuous parsons, whether Christian or, quote, secular, in the persons of parlor, parliamentary socialists, cannot see, understand, and feel this necessity. Only a lifeless man in the muffler, a narrow-minded Philistine scared of initiative and new ideas, can shun the revolution for this reason instead of plunging into battle with the utmost ardor and determination at a time when history demands that the greatest problems of humanity be solved by struggle and war. The American people have a revolutionary tradition which has been adopted by the best representatives of the American proletariat, who have repeatedly expressed their complete solidarity with us Bolsheviks. That tradition is the war of liberation against the British in the 18th century and the civil war in the 19th century. In some respects, if we only take into consideration the destruction of some branches of industry and of the national economy, America in 1870 was behind 1860. But what a pedant, what an idiot, would anyone be to deny on these grounds the immense, world-historic, progressive, and revolutionary significance of the American Civil War of 1863-65. The representatives of the bourgeoisie understand that for the sake of overthrowing Negro slavery, of overthrowing the rule of the slave owners, it was worth letting the country go through long years of civil war, through the abysmal ruin, destruction, and terror that accompany every war. But now, when we are confronted with the vastly greater task of overthrowing capitalist wage slavery, of overthrowing the rule of the bourgeoisie, 
Now, the representatives and defenders of the bourgeoisie and also the reformist socialists who have been frightened by the bourgeoisie and are shunning the revolution cannot and do not want to understand that civil war is necessary and legitimate. The American workers will not follow the bourgeoisie. They will be with us for civil war against the bourgeoisie. The whole history of the world and of the American labor movement strengthens my conviction that this is so. I also recall the words of one of the most beloved leaders of the American proletariat, Eugene Debs, who wrote in the Appeal to Reason, I believe towards the end of 1915 in the article, What Shall I Fight For? I quoted this article at the beginning of 1916 at a public meeting of workers in Bern, Switzerland, that he, Debs, would rather be shot than vote credits for the present criminal and reactionary war, that he, Debs, knows of only one holy and, from the proletarian standpoint, legitimate war, namely, the war against the capitalists, the war to liberate mankind from wage slavery. I am not surprised that Wilson, the head of the American multimillionaires and servant of the capitalist sharks, has thrown Debs into prison. Let the bourgeoisie be brutal to the true internationalists, to the true representatives of the revolutionary proletariat. The more fierce and brutal they are, the nearer the day of the victorious proletarian revolution. We are blamed for the destruction caused by our revolution. Who are the accusers? The hangers-on of the bourgeoisie, of that very bourgeoisie who, during the four years of the imperialist war, have destroyed almost the whole of European culture and have reduced Europe to barbarism, brutality, and starvation. These bourgeoisie now demand we should not make a revolution on these ruins, amidst this wreckage of culture, amidst the wreckage and ruins created by the war, nor with the people who have been brutalized by the war. How humane and righteous the bourgeoisie are. Their servants accuse us of resorting to terror. The British bourgeoisie have forgotten their 1649. The French bourgeoisie have forgotten their 1793. Terror was just and legitimate when the bourgeoisie resorted to it for their own benefit against feudalism. Terror became monstrous and criminal when the workers and poor peasants dared to use it against the bourgeoisie. Terror was just and legitimate when used for the purpose of substituting one exploiting minority for another exploiting minority. Terror became monstrous and criminal when it began to be used for the purpose of overthrowing every exploiting minority, to be used in the interests of the vast actual majority, in the interests of the proletariat and semi-proletariat, the working class and the poor peasants. The international imperialist bourgeoisie have slaughtered 10 million men and maimed 20 million in their war, the war to decide whether the British or the German vultures are to rule the world. If our war, the war of the oppressed and exploited against the oppressors and the exploiters, results in half a million or a million casualties in all countries, the bourgeoisie will say that the former casualties are justified while the latter are criminal. The proletariat will have something entirely different to say. Now, amidst the horrors of the imperialist war, the proletariat is receiving a most vivid and striking illustration of the great truth taught by all revolutions and bequeathed to the workers by their best teachers, the founders of modern socialism. This truth is that no revolution can be successful unless the resistance of the exploiters is crushed. When we, the workers and toiling peasants, captured state power, it became our duty to crush the resistance of the exploiters. We are proud we have been doing this. We regret we are not doing it with sufficient firmness and determination. We know that fierce resistance to the socialist revolution on the part of the bourgeoisie is inevitable in all countries, and that this resistance will grow with the growth of this revolution. The proletariat will crush this resistance. During the struggle against the resisting bourgeoisie, it will finally mature for victory and for power. Let the corrupt bourgeois press shout to the whole world about our every mistake our revolution makes. We are not daunted by our mistakes. People have not become saints because the revolution has begun. The toiling classes who for centuries have been oppressed, downtrodden, and forcibly held in the vice of poverty, brutality, and ignorance cannot avoid mistakes when making a revolution. And, as I pointed out once before, the corpse of bourgeois society cannot be nailed in a coffin and buried. The corpse of capitalism is decaying and disintegrating in our midst. 
polluting the air and poisoning our lives, enmeshing that which is new, fresh, young, and virile in thousands of threads and bonds of that which is old, moribund, and decaying. For every hundred mistakes we commit, and which the bourgeoisie and their lackeys, including our own Mensheviks and right socialist revolutionaries, shout about to the whole world, 10,000 great and heroic deeds are performed, greater and more heroic because they are simple and inconspicuous amidst the everyday life of a factory district or a remote village, performed by people who are not accustomed and have no opportunity to shout to the whole world about their successes. But even if the contrary were true, although I know such an assumption is wrong, even if we committed 10,000 mistakes for every 100 correct actions we performed, even in that case our revolution would be great and invincible, and so it will be in the eyes of world history, because for the first time, not the minority, not the rich alone, not the educated alone, but the real people, the vast majority of the working people, are themselves building a new life, are by their own experience solving the most difficult problems of socialist organization. Every mistake committed in the course of such work, in the course of this most conscientious and earnest work of tens of millions of simple workers and peasants in reorganizing their whole life, every such mistake is worth thousands and millions of, quote, lawless successes achieved by the exploiting minority, successes in swindling and duping the working people. For only through such mistakes will the workers and peasants learn to build the new life, learn to do without capitalists, only in this way will they hack a path for themselves through thousands of obstacles to victorious socialism. Mistakes are being committed in the course of their revolutionary work by our peasants, who at one stroke in one night, October 25 to 26, 1917, entirely abolished the private ownership of land and are now, month after month, overcoming tremendous difficulties and correcting their mistakes themselves, solving in a practical way the most difficult tasks of organizing new conditions of economic life, of fighting the kulaks, providing land for the working people and not for the rich, and of changing to communist large-scale agriculture. Mistakes are being committed in the course of their revolutionary work by our workers, who have already, after a few months, nationalized almost all the biggest factories and plants and are learning by hard, everyday work the new task of managing whole branches of industry, are setting the nationalized enterprises going, overcoming the powerful resistance of inertia, petty bourgeois mentality and selfishness, and brick by brick are laying the foundation of new social ties, of a new labor discipline, of a new influence of the workers' trade unions over their members. Mistakes are committed in the course of their revolutionary work by our Soviets, which were created as far back as 1905 by a mighty upsurge of the people. The Soviets of workers and peasants are a new type of state, a new and higher type of democracy, a form of the proletarian dictatorship, a means of administering the state without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie. For the first time, democracy is here serving the people, the working people, and has ceased to be democracy for the rich, as it still is in all bourgeois republics, even the most democratic. For the first time, the people are grappling, on a scale involving 100 million, with the problem of implementing the dictatorship of the proletariat and semi-proletariat, a problem which, if not solved, makes socialism out of the question. Let the pedants, or the people whose minds are incurably stuffed with bourgeois democratic or parliamentary prejudices, shake their heads in perplexity about our Soviets, about the absence of direct elections, for example. These people have forgotten nothing and have learned nothing during the period of the great upheavals of 1914 to 18. The combination of the proletarian dictatorship with the new democracy for the working people, of civil war with the widest participation of the people in politics, such a combination cannot be brought about at one stroke, nor does it fit in with the outworn modes of routine parliamentary democracy. The contours of a new world, the world of socialism, are rising before us in the shape of the Soviet Republic. It is not surprising that this world does not come into being ready-made, does not spring forth like Minerva from the head of Jupiter. The old bourgeois democratic constitutions waxed eloquent about formal equality and right of assembly, but our proletarian and peasant Soviet constitution casts aside the hypocrisy of formal equality. 
When the bourgeois Republicans overturned thrones, they didn't worry about formal equality between monarchists and Republicans. When it is a matter of overthrowing the bourgeoisie, only traitors or idiots can demand formal equality of rights for the bourgeoisie. Freedom of assembly for workers and peasants is not worth a farthing when the best buildings belong to the bourgeoisie. Our Soviets have confiscated all the good buildings in town and country from the rich and have transferred all of them to the workers and peasants for their unions and meetings. This is our freedom of assembly for the working people. This is the meaning and content of our Soviet, our socialist constitution. That is why we are also firmly convinced that no matter what misfortunes may still be in store for it, our Republic of Soviets is invincible. It's invincible because every blow struck by frenzied imperialism, every defeat the international bourgeoisie inflict on us, rouses more and more sections of the workers and peasants to the struggle, teaches them at the cost of enormous sacrifice, steals them, and engenders new heroism on a mass scale. We know that help from you will probably not come soon, comrade American workers, for the revolution is developing in different countries in different forms and at different tempos, and it cannot be otherwise. We know that although the European proletarian revolution has been maturing very rapidly lately, it may, after all, not flare up within the next few weeks. We are banking on the inevitability of the world revolution, but this doesn't mean that we are such fools as to bank on the revolution inevitably coming on a definite and early date. We have seen two great revolutions in our country, 1905 and 1917, and we know revolutions are not made to order or by agreement. We know that circumstances brought our Russian detachment of the socialist proletariat to the fore, not because of our merits, but because of the exceptional backwardness of Russia, and that before the world revolution breaks out, a number of separate revolutions may be defeated. In spite of this, we are firmly convinced that we are invincible because the spirit of mankind will not be broken by the imperialist slaughter. Mankind will vanquish it. And the first country to break the convict chains of the imperialist war was our country. We sustained enormously heavy casualties in the struggle to break these chains, but we broke them. We are free from imperialist dependence. We have raised the banner of struggle for the complete overthrow of imperialism for the whole world to see. We are now, as it were, in a besieged fortress, waiting for the other detachments of the World Socialist Revolution to come to our relief. These detachments exist. They are more numerous than ours. They are maturing, growing, gaining more strength the longer the brutalities of imperialism continue. The workers are breaking away from their social traitors, the Gomperses, Hendersons, Renaudels, Scheidemans, and Renners. Slowly but surely, the workers are adopting communist Bolshevik tactics and are marching towards this proletariat revolution, which alone is capable of saving dying culture and dying mankind. In short, we are invincible because the world proletarian revolution is invincible. And Lenin, August 20. 1918. So there are a few endnotes. I'll include a link to the source file in the description, as I always do. Um, the main endnote that I want to hone in on is the first one. Uh, Lenin referred in the beginning to a comrade who brought the letter to the USA. And it says, The dispatch of the letter to America was organized by the Bolshevik M.M. Borodin, who had recently been there. With the foreign military intervention and the blockade of Soviet Russia, this involved considerable difficulties. The letter was delivered to the United States by P.A. Traven Sledov. Along with the letter, he brought the constitution of the RSFSR and the Soviet government's note to President Wilson containing the demand to stop the intervention. The well-known American socialist and journalist John Reed secured the publication of all these documents in the American press. In December 1918, a slightly abridged version of the letter appeared in the New York magazine The Class Struggle and the Boston Weekly The Revolutionary Age, both organs of the left wing of the American Socialist Party. The Revolutionary Age was brought out by John Reed and Sen Katayama. The letter evoked keen interest among readers, and it was published as a reprint from The Class Struggle in a large number of copies. Subsequently, it was published many times in the bourgeois and socialist press of the USA and Western Europe, 
in the French socialist magazine Demain, number 28 and 29, 1918, in number 138 of The Call, organ of the British Socialist Party, the Berlin magazine Die Action, number 51 to 52, 1918, and elsewhere. In 1934, the letter was brought out in New York in the form of a pamphlet which contained the passages omitted in earlier publications. The letter was widely used by the American left socialists and was instrumental in aiding the development of the labor and communist movement in the U.S. and Europe. It helped advanced workers to appreciate the nature of imperialism and the great revolutionary changes affected by the Soviet government. Lenin's letter aroused a mounting protest in the U.S. against the armed intervention. So um, normally I add some discussion and comments to the end of the audio books. Um, I don't want to add too much to this one because I think it's just so inspiring. And uh, particularly at the end, it really just sweeps up together into a really rousing um, series of images and uh it's very inspiring, motivating, and, and provocative, and, and I think that that's great uh, in the way that Lenin does it there. I do want to say, though, the reason uh, why now in February 2021, it's um, someone in the comments, I don't know if it was on Facebook or YouTube, but brought up Lenin's letter to American workers in the discussion around Civil War and the Boogaloo Boys, um, and so I thought, you know, let's do it on the channel and just air out this famous letter and, you know, see, does this actually have any applicability to 2021 and the idea of the left uniting with the right, et cetera, et cetera. I think, um, you know, as was my comment on uh, yesterday's audio file, the U.S., as I've said before, I think is probably going to be one of the last countries ever to experience revolution, probably the entire rest of the world. Um, assuming that the socialist revolution is invincible, as Lenin says, um, it probably will be one of the last places. Probably the entire rest of the world will go socialist before the USA. Would be, if I had to put money on any one country, I'd put it on the USA, uh, being the last holdout. Um, you know, there's a number of reasons for that. I think it's the most reactionary country in the world. People have their heads. I mean, many working people just absolutely have their heads on backwards. The socialist left is vanishingly small, tiny, tiny, tiny. That's why I think in part we're plagued so badly by opportunism. Um, and I would expect countries like uh, India, which I understand has a lot of uh, reactionaries, and has a very right-wing government right now. However, they also have a massive communist movement <laughs> that is able to mobilize hundreds of millions of people for action. Um, the same cannot be said for the United States. People have a very, very low level of um, class consciousness, of just social consciousness generally. Uh, Lenin talks in this document about making mistakes and how... You know, they managed uh, after a couple of uprisings to have a successful revolution. And now they are trying to figure it out. They're, they're trying to figure out how to run, you know, as the working class that previously had no experience of doing this, how to run a nationalized economy. And they're the first experiment in the world to do this on this kind of scale, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this idea of making mistakes being how... Uh, people are going to learn. You know, of course, we as socialists, for me, you know, I have read some Marx and I am a committed socialist. I'm not a rando worker anymore because I have become educated in this to some extent. You know, this channel has about 1,700 subscribers right now. Nevertheless, that's not a lot. <laughs> Nevertheless, you know, I, I try to provide good faith, best guess, you know, my best effort at guidance and uh, leadership to the extent that, you know, I have any influence whatsoever. I don't have power. I have some influence. Um, and, uh, you know, because some people listen. I try my best to give uh, what leadership I can so that, you know, any mistake that 
anyone might possibly be thinking of making. If, if I happen to have knowledge that would help avoid that mistake or correct that mistake before it goes too far, you know, I want to do what I can to put my two cents out there and say, hey, no, no, no. No, I read a thing that's exactly about that or no, 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 I've been in an activist movement that did that same thing. I saw a group succumb to XYZ mistake, etc. You know, I want to put that out there because really we're facing things like climate crisis and just all kinds of horrible things. And we need this thing to move on as quickly as, as possible. And, you know, I don't know, like I said, the U.S. still might be the last country in the world, but we need to do what we can. Now, that said, we're up against, you know, uh, uh, hundreds of billions of dollars, trillions of dollars of anti-communist propaganda. Um, and this whole topic of civil war and boogaloo boys that came up in a left-right political alliance. I mean, think about that. How desperate are we that we would even consider, even consider an alliance with open right-wing militias? I want to show you here in this video, this is an example of, uh, this is an old social media account by the guy, Magnus Panvidia, the boogaloo boy, who, uh, you know, uh, right-wing Democrat, Jimmy Dore, comedy news guy, was promoting on his YouTube show. There's a communist flag alongside a fascist flag, alongside an anti-fascist flag. To think that allying with people like this, and not just, um, you know, I'm not talking about educating them. I'm not talking about giving them socialist propaganda. I'm talking about what he was talking about, just opening the floodgates of, you know, Mikasa Sukasa, <laughs> like just, just uh, completely like merging movements. That's not going to be possible with people who are, their heads are on this backwards. And people like that at, at the level of development of the workers movement in the United States right now, which has been beaten back so badly by neoliberalism, advocating for open civil war at this point of development can mean only one thing, slaughter of socialists in the United States. And that is exactly what they want because they are right wingers. They're not just confused workers. These people are full of anti-socialist propaganda. Now you could say that that's them being confused. Well, maybe some of them, but at the end of the day, these people hate socialists. They are consciously planning and working against socialists for our defeat. As tiny as we are, it's not small enough for them. It's never right-wing enough. So they want to stamp us out of existence. And that is one of the allegations that keeps coming up against the Boogaloo Boys is they show up claiming that they're doing security for Antifa or for BLM or whatever. But being out there with the guns, it heightens the tension. And will it heighten police response and violence? And then there's the case of Kyle Rittenhouse, who another right-wing armed guy steeped in this culture, showing up and killing several people at such a protest. If he had not been there, those people would still be alive. Embracing this movement is literally suicide for the tiny germinal socialist left in the United States. We are just now, with the help of social media, just starting to build back after decades of retreat and just generally bad times. We are just starting to build back in like the last five or ten years. Do we want to sacrifice, is now the time to take a gamble like that? Mistakes are one thing, obvious suicide is another. I'm going to be doing more on this topic, but I thought because somebody did bring up this letter to American workers because Lenin talks about civil war and how, you know, but compare the situation in Russia in 1917 and yes, they did fight a civil war for five years after that. Compare that situation to this one. And I want to hear, well, actually, I don't even want to hear it because I wouldn't agree. 
But, you know, when you think about this quietly, <laughs> and I don't want to hear it, uh, because now is not the time. It's not going to be the time for quite a while. Um, like I said, by the time things roll around to the United States, the capitalists might be surrendering because the entire rest of the world, in my belief, you know, probably will have gone socialist by that point, and they'll have no choice but to give up. Um, you know, compare the situation in Russia, really, in the 19-teens to the, you know, 2021 USA. All we've got right now in the way of people talking about civil war, mainly right-wing agitators who are trying to get us killed, period. You really think you can just open up the floodgates and work with these people? You really think they're coming in good faith because they're, uh, you know, pro-LGBT capitalists? I mean, so are the Democrats. Are we advocating working with them? Or are we calling that the opportunism that it is? Thinking, oh my God, he has a Gadsden flag that don't tread on me that's also a pride flag. I should listen to him when he talks about civil war. No, 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 you shouldn't. We need to win over neighbors, not work with enemies. That's what we need to do as socialists. We need to build the socialist movement. We need to make more socialists. And focusing on the people you are least likely to make into a socialist is a complete and utter waste of time, and you're exposing yourself to harm. We haven't even talked about the racial angle. I'm a white guy. Many socialists are not white guys. They are people of color. They are women of color. You know, it's all well and good for Jimmy Dore, comfortable as he is to sit in his, you know, million dollar garage in Los Angeles and uh, well insulated from any fallout of anything happening on the ground and to say, oh, yeah, let's totally work with these people. And, you know, um, <laughs> he's making tons of vulnerable people that much more vulnerable uh, by giving credibility and credence to the lies of the right-wing militia movement, which literally has been nothing but chaos and devastation for the left and for U.S. society in general. You know, socialism, we are all about trying to take industrialized society to a higher level of organization and peace and justice for working people, you know, that we can live without being preyed upon and uh, enjoy the fruits of our labor and have more leisure time and live less anxious and stressful lives. The exact opposite of what we have now. And um, unfortunately, we're not organized enough to even pull off a serious general strike. You know, the government paid us to stay home. That was similar to a general strike this year. But uh, those were, you know, very fleeting circumstances and very special circumstances. Our movement now in 2021, about 100 years after Lenin wrote this, we are coming back, just starting to come back, like I said, after several decades of real severe defeat. And um, let's not jump the gun here, and let's not destroy this thing that we have just started turning into some recognizable numbers again. That's it for this edition of Socialism for All. We will catch you on the next one. And that's the video. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen or just support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash socialism for all and sign up for a monthly donation. You can also follow us at facebook.com slash socialism, the number for all used to have a page at F O R all and it got throttled to death by Zuck here on YouTube. Please click the like button, subscribe button and the notifications bell. Please leave a comment if you can, and please share our video wherever you're online, your Twitter feed, your Discord servers, Reddit subs, etc. All of that helps more people to see this content, whether it's in the YouTube algorithm or just posting it on other sites. All of that's helpful. All of you out there supporting and promoting this content makes it all go that much more smoothly. We need to end capitalism, normalize talking about socialism today, and uh, it's really kind of our only hope for a better tomorrow. Thanks for all you do, and we will catch you in the next video.